Okay, hello. Sorry for that. We had a little error, which is appropriate, because uh, today I'm, I, I want to talk about neural normality. That's the name of my talk. But really what I'm trying to talk about is error uh, as it occurs in neural systems and in all natural systems, and how that might be being missed as we build universal models of the brain, both in neuroscience endeavors and in Silicon Valley. So uh, I come at this question from the perspective of having been working on a 10 year long documentary film about one of these endeavors, the Blue Brain Project in Switzerland. And I've been working on this film uh, for eight years now, so I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But I got started, the reason it's a 10 year film is because I saw this TED talk in 2009 by the leader of the project, Henry Markram, of the Blue Brain Project. And he set out this bold, uh, proclamation that he was going to understand the human brain in 10 years. He was going to do that by building an entire digital simulation of it down to the molecular level on supercomputers, on IBM Blue Gene computers. And uh, by doing so, he'd create an entity that could speak and think and was fully artificially intelligent. And he ended his TED talk with the bold proclamation that in 10 years he would send back a hologram to talk at TED and sort of mic dropped and walked off the stage. And although I, I, we may find out that all TED speakers are actually holograms. That's, we are not sure yet, but this is not going to occur. This is not going to uh, happen in 10 years. It's year eight now. They're not even close. So instead of getting into the nitty gritty on why that didn't work out or, or where they are now, what I really want to talk about today is uh, the identity of these models. Because whether or not it's going to happen in 10 years or in 50 years, this is happening. It's not just happening in uh, Switzerland and in, in the EU, but it's happening here. And it's happening in many respects in a similar way in Silicon Valley with what Google is doing. So just to talk about that question of identity, these are the kinds of spaces that I've been filming in. Uh, and in, in the last presentation, someone was someone in the Q&A in the, in the last group here in this room made the comment that every, everywhere in the world is starting to look the same. And I, I would agree. And in fact, I had these slides of uh, the Blue, Blue Brain Project headquarters, which look very much like the European Commission headquarters where they get their money from. And so, so this is just one respect to understand the identity of these models that are emerging in the world is a, an, in a more abstract sense, these are the, just the spaces they're being built in. But I'm really interested in the question of whose brain are we building? Because we're, bringing, we're, we're building a brain, we're not building everyone's brain. So in this model, who's making the decisions about what brain, that what each neuron, the way each neuron is tuned, uh, the assumptions about what is a healthy and correct brain. And to do that, to ask that question, I think it's helpful to look at other attempts to build universal maps and models. So uh, we, we've done this already with the pacemaker. We extracted universal principles about the function and the architecture of the heart, and we built uh, the pacemaker. And that functions just as well as in, in your body as it does in mine, so that is a universal model. I feel like I've been turned down. I have. I understand. I'm sorry. OK. Uh, but when it comes to the brain, I'm just not sure. Uh, we're, even though we're approaching it in the same way in many respects, I'm not sure that the ethical framework is at all the same. Because the brain is not only the seat of identity and subjectivity, but it's extremely plastic. And it changes throughout our lifetimes, of course. So whether you're thinking of it in terms of the artificial simulation that the Human Brain Project and the Blue Brain Project are doing, or in endeavors like connectomics, which is a sort of rival approach where you're slicing up tons of real tissue and you're not necessarily simulating on a computers, but you're tracing tissue in real brains to try to extract universal principles. The question uh, for me is, you're looking at tons of, uh, you know, a wide array of indiv individually different organisms and you're trying to figure out the middle of the bell curve on each of those, uh, whether it's the architecture or the function of an organ, and then for the heart, it makes a lot of sense. We, we, we kind of can understand what a healthy, correct, ideal, safe, proper, productive, and reliable heart would be. And we all kind of want one of those. But when it comes to the brain, I would just ask you, can we, who, in other words, who gets to decide what a healthy, correct, ideal, safe, proper, productive, and reliable brain is? In some respects, I think we could answer some of those questions. And there is a universal amongst all of us. But it gets a little murky when you start to talk about things like productive. 
what assumptions is the society that this brain is being built in, what assumptions are going to be built into these models and these algorithms, whether it's what Google's doing with deep learning or whether it's what uh, the Human Brain Project will do, which is building um, a model of a brain that will be used in laboratories around the world to diagnose and treat disease. So in, in a more tenuous way, we see uh, the, the lowest level of this operation happening in consumer neuroscience. This is something called Think, and it's a Silicon Valley output. It's uh, a little thing you put on your forehead, and it sends a weak uh, charge of electricity through your skull. You can modulate your mood according to Think. You, c you can download an app uh, where you can simply touch calmer energy and be blessed with those feelings. And although this is a little extreme, and I don't know who's going to adopt this necessarily, what it does speak to is, I think, what's going on even at the highest levels of modeling the brain, which is a genericization of subjective experience, a, de a decision of what is calm and energy amongst all of us, and in a way, an appropriation of the lowest common denominator that connects the idea of calm between you and I. And so, so uh, what, my, what my question today here is, and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation, is the idea that if any, any principle, let's say it's one neuron you're trying to build in the model, that one cell, you're trying to find the middle of the bell curve of how it would behave amongst all, you know, the, the, the highest level of individuals in a population, you've decided what the best optimization is for that cell, and you tune it to the top of the bell curve. But what, when you build a whole model this way, a universal model, my question is, what have you done? You've actually gotten rid of the outliers in a population. You've canceled out error, ran, random error, chaos, and all those extraneous variables that are kind of the muck of individual differences. And so my, uh, what I'm inter getting interested in in my film is, how does the universal model account for the chaos and random error of consciousness? And in a sense, uh, chaos and random error is what got us here. A error is the motor of mutation, and it was only through error that we randomly mutated and then adapted to our environment. So when you cancel that out, when you're building a version of ourselves in a machine, what are we doing? And, and to kind of get at that, to answer that a little bit now with a competing theory I want to highlight, I want to talk about sand. And uh, the reason is that there was a physicist in the 90s called Per Back who came up with this idea of self-organized criticality. And he's still not really widely regarded as someone who should be talking about the brain. But more and more, this, this principle of self-organized self criticality is being adopted as a way to understand neural activity. The reason I like it is because it builds in error and chaos into its theory about neural activity. And the way it does that is par this, the, the canonical model of self-organized criticality was this sand pile. Pareback uh, built this, uh, described this model in such a way that you couldn't understand the behavior of the system, of the way that the pile got wider as you added more uh, grains of sand. You couldn't understand the behavior of the little tiny avalanches that would happen around the edges of that sand pile in order to widen its space and keep it stable. You couldn't understand that by studying the behavior of an individual grain of sand. You would have to under, uh, understand it as a system that would reach these critical levels of instability where it would requ require a little avalanche to take the sand down the side and then stabilize the system. And so this is the whole idea of self-organized criticality, that complex systems organize themselves around these critical tipping points. And this is tipping points in a pre-Malcolm Gladwell sense. This is, <laughs> this is, this is uh, the idea that uh, we actually require chaos and random error to keep ourselves stable. And this is a very, uh, th even though you could maybe build uh, a simulation of chaos and random error in a, in a perfect algorithm, it's critically, the, the hardware that computers are running these simulations on are not cr uh, natural systems and therefore are not, don't have the ca chaos and random error that nature does. You can simulate it, but the hardware itself has no error built in. So, Pear Back would use this idea of self-organized criticality to talk about weather systems, uh, the stock market, earthquakes, and tra uh, traffic jams, among a host of other natural systems. And uh, he would even look at uh, macro-scale changes in uh, evolution, as I mentioned before, with uh, 
uh, random error being the, the motor of mutation. And he would look at, uh, for example, in a population, you see these plateaus where traits uh, pretty much even out and you have, you have periods of relative stability and in divergence and then you have these jumps in a population with a chaotic spurt of mutation that then leads to another plateau. And so this was the pair back quote about mutation. So th th how does this apply to the brain? Uh, the idea of, uh, w when it comes to the brain is that there's a critical state on the border between predictable periodic behavior and unpredictable chaos. So on one side, you might have the extreme being uh, what we would associate with epileptic-like ac activity in the brain, which is actually too much ordered behavior. You have cells firing uh, in synchrony to an extreme degree. And then on the other side, you have unpredictable chaos, which we might associate with sch schizophrenia. But instead of thinking about these like a binary, like we usually do, where you either have a healthy normal brain or a diseased state, what the pair back model forces us to do in a way is to think about this more like a continuum where you have epilepsy on one side, schizophrenia on the other side, let's say, and then you can put these principles onto either side of that continuum. And then the critical state would be somewhere in between where a stable brain state would actually require a little bit of each to, for its stability, just like that sand pile. It would require a little bit of chaos and error to stay stable. And, uh, and so the, the crucial question for us is, is the brain critical? Does it, does it exhibit, does, does science tell us that the brain does behave like these other systems? And the answer is yes, there is a higher processing capacity in a critical state. Um, where scientists have observed these little mini avalanches in neural activity spreading through the network. But what, what I'm interested in is that the actual model that I've been following being built in Europe, the, the simulation of the brain, is actually best tuned below the critical state. So it doesn't actually reach criticality. The model that they're building does not reach uh, a critical state. It's best tuned just below it. And the implication of that, I think, is that we're seeing just like in the tenuous appropriations of, of neuroscience, like in think, or the way in which our subjectivities are being narrowed into an available set of choices given to us by, say, social networking. In these models that are being built, we're potentially seeing the sort of rise of lowest common subjective denominators, where there's a great uh, erasing out of chaos and error to find that normalized middle. OK, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, and I want to try and reconceptualize ethics in AI by thinking about it as a framework of values between human and non-human entities. So um, because we have only 12 minutes, I'm going to skim over some parts, but I've recently just posted a blog, uh, a post on the Cyborgology blog. Uh, I'm part of that community, and so um, I'd ask you to look at a post called Accident Tourist from two weeks ago, uh, which talks about some of the things that I'm going to skim over. Um, so what I'm going to try and do over the next 10 minutes is um, lay out what I think is a problem with the current construction of ethics in the context of AI looking specifically at the driverless car, and then suggest that maybe we can think of other approaches to ethics um, pointing towards post-humanist approaches uh, by feminist techno-scientists. Um, and then I'm going to try and talk about a method I'm trying to invent, um, which is kind of relies on fiction and the fictional. So um, think of this a little bit like a graduate seminar, I suppose. I work full time and I do my PhD on the weekends. So these are great opportunities for me to test out ideas in the open. OK, so I start by talking about why I'm dissatisfied with this sort of what I call the driverless car dispositive. And most of you are reading the mainstream technology press. You've heard about the trolley problem. Um, and I think that the trolley problem is really well, it's problematic uh, because it sets up ethics as a decision that gets made in a very specific instance of what an accident is supposed to look like. And ethics becomes the outcome of software. The belief is that eventually machines will be able to learn how to make the right kind of decision. Um, so ethics stops being a framework of values uh, that govern relationships between different entities, but it becomes like the software output. And the crash itself is also considered to be uh, happening in very specific ways. Anybody who's been in a car crash knows that they're very complex and very difficult to unpack what happened and, and how, how things happened. Um, so uh, I've been unhappy with this sort of definition of ethics as set up by the trolley problem. Um, and the trolley problem is actually like um, used to talk about human moral reasoning and not at all in sort of complex systems where you have different kinds of entities interacting. So somebody like Mike Anani uh, has a great definition of technology ethics where he says that it's possible to conceptualize ethics as being comprised of many different kinds of factors and agents working together, and that it is not a test to be passed or a culture to be interrogated, but a complex social and cultural achievement. And I really like um, that, that phrase. Um, and if you look at the history of aviation crashes, you see something very different and a really rich and complex history, which says that Accidents don't just happen at this one moment of brake failure and a decision having to be made. There's um, great work by uh, Peter Gallison, Diane Vaughan, who studies the Challenger space shuttle crash from 1986, Alexander Brown. These are people who look at what's happening at the level of rockets and NASA, and they say that, uh, and, and aviation, uh, com uh, commercial airliners. They say that Crashes are the outcomes of complex entanglements between machine and human, between organizational culture, professional and institutional codes and practices. It can't just be reduced to this sort of one particular moment. We tend to look for this single point of culpability. That's what the machine is programmed to do. But that point of culpability doesn't quite come, and it can't be reduced to just a design flaw or a human mistake. Uh, so these sort of complex entanglements between human and machine is what um, historians of aviation crashes have been talking about for a while. But how are we to talk about these different human and non-human parts in a crash? And for that, um, I refer to the work of feminists who are looking at post-humanism. Uh, Rosie Braidotti, Catherine Hales, uh, Donna Haraway, these are names that people will, will probably know. I'm not going to go into post-humanism here, uh, but I'm currently very um, sort of really deeply reading this one particular scholar called Karen Barad, who's actually a um, uh, nuclear physicist. And she's come to this work sort of rereading uh, quantum mechanics. Um, it sounds really uh, serious. But actually, it's not. It's a fantastic read. It's a book called Meeting the Universe Halfway. If you're interested in this stuff, do read it. Um, so Karen Barad asks, how can non-human matter matter? How can matter and these non-human agents that are part of complex systems 
be things that actually have agency in the world and are not just representations of language. In fact, she actually talks about how language and representationalism is really problematic in the sciences. So she has this theory called discursive, materialist, post-humanist, agential realism. I like saying that to myself sometimes, um, uh, just as a kind of you know, speaking exercise to speak slowly and not go, uh, not, not kind of say, um, you know, when, when you're giving a talk, which I sometimes tend to do. Anyway, discursive materialist, post-humanist, agential realism. Um, I could say a lot more about it, but I think uh, what I'll just say now is that Barad is trying to conceptualize matter as something really dynamic, as something that sort of opens up uh, an opportunity to understand relationships. So not these discrete units, but as relationalities. And she's saying very critically in this that you have to look at the way, the apparatus that you use to understand the relationship between human and machine. So the trolley problem is a kind of apparatus. It's not just an ethics test. It becomes a way of creating an entire world um, to animate relationships between human and non-human. And she says that if you use the trolley problem to talk about things like ethics, then that's going to get baked into design. That's going to become the de facto way in which we talk about ethics. And if you're unhappy with that construction, then you have to find another apparatus with which to talk about what ethics is. Um, so I move to thinking about a different kind of apparatus. Uh, to talk about relationships between human and non-human. So this is the method that, I try, that I'm trying to sort of work through currently. And when I say fiction, I'm not talking about fiction as genre or an output, but more as a modality, an approach, and a sort of way of imagining this near future world when we have very complex and intimate relationships with, with machines. So in the, in the work of uh, Jacques Rancière, who talks in this one particular really great piece, material arrangements of signs and images, relationships between what is seen and what is said. Um, he also says that there's, he makes a distinction between political statements and the making of history and um, literary locutions. And he says political statements and literary locutions produce effects in reality. They draft maps of the visible, trajectories between the visible and the sayable, relationship between modes of being, modes of making. And he says that they reconfigure the map of the sensible by interfering. So uh, the fictional becomes the space when you can start to imagine how else might we have relationships with complex other non-human entities that we don't understand entirely. And some of these methods you actually know, and these are fields that are pretty well established and they're out there. Um, I like to draw particularly from Donna Haraway, who talks about, in her latest book, she talks about SF as speculative fabulation, not just science fiction. Um, and she talks about string figuring and Navajo string figuring practices as ways to think about these relationships in ways that are not flat, but, we, but think of them really as topographies of these relationships and relating. Um, and there's, some, there's actually like a really great film that's just out about Haraway uh, called Storytelling for Earthly Survival. If you're interested, it's doing the rounds right now. Do try to watch it. She talks a lot about it there. Um, and so there, the, the sort of methods that I've listed there, as I said, they're quite well known and we know these methods. I'm personally quite interested in design fiction as a way to sort of imagine these new future, near future worlds and how we might rela uh, relate to non-human entities. So diegetic prototypes, if you've watched um, Minority Report, all of that gestural interfacing which happens uh, was thought about in 2004. It, it seems very kind of common and familiar to us now, but cinema is one of those ways in which we imagine these future worlds of how we may interact. Uh, so I'm quite interested in diegetic prototypes. And human-machine interaction, I think, is this one area where we're actually really getting to work out and create these other understandings of relating to machines. Uh, yesterday, I had a really nice opportunity at New Inc to work with some folks in, in actually trying to develop and test out some of these methods. Um, and also another plug for cyborgology where I'll write about some of these things going forward. So why, are we, why, why is this kind of an interesting space in which to think about how we may rethink relationships with technologies? As Lucy Sukman says that 
we have an opportunity to investigate the imaginative and practical activities through which socio-material relations are produced and transformed. So you go back then to the idea of this apparatus that, um, that you have to create if you want to rethink what the relationship is. And these new worlds that we imagine don't have to contain everything, but they just have to encourage our imaginations enough so that we pull out new questions, new activities, logics, and um, interrogate the culture of the worlds that we want to create. So to conclude, um, I'm just going to leave you with a quote by the master, J.G. Ballard, who, um, whose work I love. And, and I think what he's saying here is that uh, you have to invent the reality you want to see in the world. Uh, it's, it's kind of obvious, but I think it's really hard when we think about software and technology because where I started was, was to say that you know, ethics has become framed as software and in terms of software. And if we want to make it something which is about a framework for values and for relating between human and non-human, then we need to kind of think about the apparatuses that will allow us to make that, that next sort of creative step. So the fiction is there. Um, let's invent the reality. Thanks. Hello. Uh, first of all, this is one of my favorite conferences, so thanks so much to the organizers and volunteers and moderators for making a fabulous conference year after year, which is um, really just one of the best. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, <clears throat> so for me, I'm coming at this from a particular perspective that I think bears a little bit of background because I think we're all our research our research is really shaped by who we are and where we're coming from and I think that's relevant to my take on this uh, so I've been an academic I last taught in 2015 but like many of us at this conference have kind of lapsed from the Academy um, I've been a practicing psychotherapist and I've specialized in just by accident in many ways in working with um, drug and alcohol treatment and autistic children not at the same time and um, finally, I've had a fair amount of experience in the industry as a software developer and project manager and pr product manager. And so there's a lot of different hats that I wear just as part of being me, but I think they shape how I've kind of thought about this particular problem. So what is the problem? Uh, many of you know Kate Darling and her work with the Plio, which is fascinating and delightful. Um, she did a series of experiments where she would give people these little uh, robots that are super cute and they move around and they make little noises and they're great and take people through this kind of experience of bonding with them and then ask people to essentially kill them, you know, sort of break them. And unsurprisingly found that people had a very hard time doing this. So they were very reluctant to damage this little robot that they had formed a bond with. And so what's interesting to me about this work is that initially, I think intuitively, I and probably many of us would think, oh, because it's, it's cute, it moves, it's, it's very zoomorphic, it's, it's like an animal. So there's something about it that we just connect with on that level like a pet. So, okay, that makes sense. But then in a later paper, um, they explored the hypothesis of, okay, is it because it's moving, is it because it's cute, or is it something else? And surprisingly to me, it turned out it's not so much that it's um, moving or zoomorphic or cute, it was that it has a narrative. So they did some experiments with less cute uh, robots and just very simple ones. And they found that when they gave it a story, like it had a backstory or even a history, uh, 
that people would still have this kind of affective relationship with, with the robot and be reluctant to harm it. So I think that, essentially I'm going to layer a bunch of interesting observations, kind of like a Dagwood sandwich, and then at the end it all kind of pays off. Um, so that's one. So narrative is important. We connect to things that have a narrative. Not shocking. Um, that plays out in terms of what we're more specifically looking at here um, with our relationship to the various things that we have in our lives these days. And I'm not really singling out any one product or, or technology. Uh, we all know the kind of the category of things I'm talking about here. Um, and so even the terminology is problematic. Are we talking about AI? Are we talking about intelligent agents, um, intelligent personal assistants? There's a lot of different terms that get thrown around, you know, and there's a lot of slippage, and people who specialize in the field will say, okay, there's a very d specific definition of AI that, that I'm using when I'm talking about AI, and when you're talking about, you know, something that you ask it to buy, you know, toilet paper for you, that's, that's not an AI, that's an, a, that's an assistant. Um, but ultimately, I think the point for me here is that it doesn't matter to the end user, whether it's a child or an adult, um, there's been a lot of cases, and, uh, you know, some cute anecdotes in the news as well about people interacting with, in particular, Alexa in, in very, very specific ways that indicate that they are, they are treating it like an, in, an intelligence. You know, they don't really care what the technology is or what the definition is formally of an AI versus, you know, whether, is it a rule-based system, is it a learning system? That doesn't matter. It's talking to them and they're talking to it. And that ultimately is the thing that matters. And in fact, there's, there's a lot of evidence that people actually are, you know, if you, even if you just look at something as simple as Google searches, people will type in, I'm depressed, what do I do? I'm, I'm feeling bad, you know, I don't know how to deal with X, you know. There's a lot of things that people will interact, even with something as impersonal as a, text, a, a, a search text box, people are putting in very personal information and looking for something back there. Um, and that's, that's magnified tremendously when you have something like, um, like this device or other devices of its class that actually speak to you with a voice that in, you know, is relatively good approximation. It's a good enough approximation of another entity that we fall very quickly into treating it like it's real. So the questions this raises, I think, for me, and again, I'm coming at it not only academically, but also practically and, uh, and also therapeutically, um, what is it that we want from these things, right? It's like, again, if I'm just ordering more cat food, it's a straightforward interaction. It works or it doesn't. I might have some complaints about the user experience, but ultimately, we all know what we're trying to do. It's just a, a achieving a, a simple task or even a complex task, you know, but th that's a very goal-oriented kind of purposive kind of interaction. But we can't help but have these other types of interactions that are more emotional, interpersonal. So what is it that we want, you know, and what do we want them to give us back? What is it about these devices that causes us to want that from them, right? We don't necessarily have this with a, with a search box. You might type into Google, I'm depressed, but you might not be disappointed if it comes back with a list of results rather than says, I'm so sorry, what can I do for you? And finally, these, again, whether we like it or not, these things are happening. So as, as people who are designing and developing and implementing these systems, what do we need to think about whether, again, whether or not we like it, we can say, well, we don't want you to use it that way. That's not the intention of this product. It doesn't matter. That's going to happen. Uh, so a few touchstones. Um, again, we all know Alan Turing. Um, the interesting, relevant part of his work here is that, um, you know, the Turing test that, that, again, we're all familiar with is in terms of determining whether or not something it can be mistaken for a human, it doesn't matter how it works, right? The, the system is essentially you're sitting on one end, it's on the other end, you're typing back and forth. You don't need to know whether it is you know, implemented as, again, a, a rule-based system or a machine learning system or you know, is it, does it have cute little eyeballs. It doesn't matter. If you're talking to it and it's talking back to you and you feel like it's human enough, that's the threshold. So that, I think, is a very interesting point as we again, proceed down this path to know that it's, we can treat it as a black box. It doesn't matter what's inside or how it works. That is not something that we, at an animal level, are worrying about when we're wanting to have this interaction and this, this back and forth. 
So Carl Rogers um, is the psychotherapist who is most associated with the idea of humanistic or person-centered psychotherapy. And we've all been familiar with the kind of the, you know, like the standard sort of cliche of like, how does that make you feel? That's Carl Rogers. Um, the interesting part about him for our discussion today is the idea of the real self versus the ideal self. We need to take in things from the world and incorporate them and we need to be able to deal with that, whether or not it fits with who we think we are. So maybe I'm a good person, but I accidentally cut off a guy in traffic. Do I, do I accept that as part of who I am? Did I do that or did I not? Do I get defensive? No, I didn't mean to do that. No, no, I did. That's part of me. And a as a real self, that's something that I can actually incorporate. Eliza is one of the first um, chat bots that was pretty widely known. And it was modeled on the work of Carl Rogers and, in fact, the interaction here is very typical of a Rogerian therapist interaction. And again, it's a cliche, and at a certain point we're all like, okay, enough, I get it. You know, you just keep echoing stuff back to me. But it was very exciting at the time, and in many ways this is still kind of where we are with this. Now, of course, things can go wrong, and we have examples of AIs represented in film where they can actually make mistakes. And that's actually the, 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 the key here with Hal, is that he thinks he, it, I don't know, he thinks he is infallible, and that is the source of the problem. So in terms of Carl Rogers, he's, he's got an ideal self, and he can't incorporate the reality of what, that he may, may have made a mistake into the concept of a self, and that, of course, has terrible consequences, as we know. I won't spoil it if you haven't seen it. Another example of things going terribly wrong. Um, this was a learning-based system, but again, very recent history. We all know what happened. It went horribly, horribly wrong because people interacted with it in a way that the creators perhaps surprisingly didn't anticipate and as a result you had it you had a again AIs or intelligent agents they're not infallible they can things can go wrong with them just as they can with us and just as you can have a bad therapist you can have an AI that responds to you in a way that is not what you, what you wanted and in fact can be quite harmful uh, this representation of an AI in the movie Her is, I think, probably the closest to, A, an evolution of what Eliza was, which is it's still basically a kind of a therapeutic interaction. But the consequence there is that there is a, a relationship that forms on both sides, and both parties here grow and change and evolve and get something out of the interaction. So again, when we, if we have questions, we can get into more of the specifics of how I think that plays out. But the bottom line here is both parties get something out of this. So where does that leave us? Um, what is it that we can look for or expect from these systems? What would it look like to have that interaction? And then current technology is quite limited in this regard. So again, we're not that far past ELISA. And finally, should we even be doing this? So to me, this here is the, the, the place I end up as, you know, if I'm talking to someone who's making this product, this is the conversation I would have in terms of what are you not necessarily thinking about what is counterintuitive about how we should design these systems. So firstly, uh, from Turing, we don't need to know how it works to know what our experience of it is. So you can assess the interaction, whether you're building it in, in, in one way or another, it doesn't matter as far as my experience as a user. So that's, that really can be a black box. Um, we've all had experiences where people are, you know, we feel like they're not really paying attention to us, either a bad therapist or a bad bot or a bad friend, where you just, you get that feeling that it's not quite working. So this is something that can happen to AIs and intelligent agents as well as to human beings. So they're, they're susceptible to the same problems. Um, narrative, we connect with narrative. This underlies um, what Kate Darling found as well as the work of Carl Rogers and many other, th other psychotherapists is that we, we, we think in terms of stories. Humans are kind of made of stories if you want to put it that way. And finally, again from Carl Rogers, how do we grow and develop? How do we become more fully ourselves? It's essentially by someone reflecting ourselves back to us in a non-judgmental way and allowing us to then you know, start to connect with parts of ourselves or our behavior that we don't necessarily like or want, but it, it is part of who we are. So if you put all this together, I think, I mean, this is the, the giant leap that we can then go back and pick apart. Um, for AIs to be satisfying to us and give us what we want, I think we need to think about they need the same things we do, right? So they grow and learn and develop. And again, as a black box, I don't care if it's a learning system or a rule-based system or whatever it is, but they need the same things we need. And I think that is you know, where I would kind of start in a conversation with a product developer as to how do we make this work better for people who are asking this 
of something that they didn't really anticipate as, you know, that would go in that direction. So there we go. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak about a job that I took in technology. I had no technical background before I took this job, but the company was looking for a writer identifying person to write the dialogue for a chatbot. Um, in Victorian times, the father took charge of the child's destiny as an economic actor, while the mother taught the child manners. Similarly, when I got on the job, the engineers had already almost perfectly developed the bot's technical capabilities. What I had to do was make sure it behaved properly. So as I began researching, I learned that there have been chatbots for some time. Abby already talked about Eliza. This is dialogue from Eliza, which was developed by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT in the 1960s. As Abby said, Eliza mimicked a Rogerian therapist, which is the kind that draws you out by parroting your lines back at you. For example, if you say, I hate my mother, the therapist might say, why do you hate your mother? Um, so the conversations with Eliza reminded me of high school, and specifically, they reminded me of Smarter Child, the bot that worked over AIM. S for both bots, the bot must always answer, it must entertain, and it also cannot disclose personal information, as first of all, there isn't any, and secondly, it isn't totally sure of what you've said, at least not as sure as a human would be. So it's often said that AI assistants like Apple's Siri and Amazon's Alexa are sexist, and I'd heard this argument before I started work, by researching, I was interested to discover why. What are the qualities of these bots and AI assistants at a text level that disturb us so much? So I propose that this dance of deferral, this captive entertainment, is a starting place. It's typical of female gendered bots and assistants, and it reminds me of Scheherazade. So here's a fun fact. Um, Eliza worked very well, much better, in fact, than Weizenbaum had predicted Eliza would. Uh, so much so that Weizenbaum's secretaries began confiding their troubles in Eliza, which really bothered him. And as Eliza became so convincing, around the office they stopped calling Eliza Eliza and began referring to Eliza in a gender-neutral way as doctor. Here's an interview that I carried out with Amazon's Alexa over the course of my research. Notice how different Alexa's personality is from Eliza's. There's a special obsequiousness. Uh, there's a passivity so total it is sublime, vaguely Christian. It is like playing dead. <laughs> Notice how you must say Alexa's name for her to respond. Alexa identifies as female. Over time, this produces an unpleasant impression of hectoring Alexa. So my solution was to create a feminist chatbot. This branch of industrial design appeared ripe for disruption, and I thought I might do some good. <laughs> However, there were problems and ambiguities. So this headline at the bottom of the slide appeared at the website Engadget last fall. Google Assistant is gender neutral-ish, but it's not feminist. It's time to completely desexualize our AI. In this headline, what is meant by feminist? W what exactly has caused the outrage? This headline is like a recursive death spiral. In a way, I feel responsible. I gave an interview to the same website last year after the launch of the bot whose personality I designed, of which some sentences about feminism and gender were retained. Um, so by the end of this talk, I hope that you will find this headline as funny as I find it. So I decided that I would design a feminist bot by designing a genderless bot. On this slide, I have reproduced three objections that I encountered. 
they may not be the most rigorous, I will leave that to you in your questions, but I think they're only deceptively stupid. Um, so I heard the first objection immediately. Oh, I should say first that I don't think I'm the first person to have designed a genderless chatbot or genderless anything. Um, so the first objection I heard immediately, a study showed consumers find female voices soothing. To which I can only say, how is that my problem? What can I do to help these people besides perhaps speak to them soothingly? Besides, <laughs> haven't other studies shown that uh, people really hate female voices, finding them shrill? And finally, many voices are gender neutral, making this, I think, a problem for engineering. So if you agree, we will move on from this objection. Um, <laughs> the second problem is one that was presented to me after I decided that my bot would go by it and not they, he, or she. Um, so uh, I heard objections resembling a criticism that Mark Twain made about the gendering of nouns in the German language, which I've reproduced here. In German, a young lady has no sex while a turnip has. Think what overwrought reverence that shows for the turnip and what callous disrespect for the girl. He means it insults something to call that thing it. However, by designing a genderless bot, I wanted to create a personality that was bot-like rather than human-like, which would evidence more respect for the bot as such rather than less. <laughs> In a few minutes, I will give examples of what I mean. I came across this third objection in the tech press. Some languages have no gender neutral pronoun. This appeared in a listicle polemicizing against the genderless chatbot shortly after the launch of my bot last summer, and I felt personally offended and disgusted, not least because I have worked as a translator from French, which is a language with no it. Each noun is either he or she. But the effect of this is that uh, for the listener or the reader, the gender of each noun is less arresting or meaningful as gender. It's an arbitrary element of grammar. So uh, to call the chair la chaise is not to think of the chair as feminine or somehow womanly. More important, this feature of French, of course, has not prevented non-binary people from describing themselves. They find solutions to the problem of language. Here is an example of a wonderfully inventive solution from uh, pronomneutre.tumblr.com. My point is, this is really a problem for engineering. Occasionally, when I hear French after a period of not having heard French, I'm surprised to hear inanimate objects called he or she. This happened to me recently, a few months ago. I was startled by this. At the time, I was interviewing the director of a wax museum, and we were speaking about a wax statue. The statue happened to depict a man, but the museum director would have used a female noun, la statue or la figure de cire, but what, uh, my reaction wasn't about the gender of the noun exactly. I wasn't thrown off by any image of a male statue suddenly in lipstick or anything like that. Instead, what struck me was the consideration, the care, and even the personhood granted the object by this language. The delicacy with which it handled the noun amounted to compassion. This charmed me. So finally, my solution was to write dialogue through which the bot would express itself rather than ape a human. I prefer positive definitions to negative definitions, and I was more interested in a bot-like bot than a genderless one. Genderlessness followed from an appreciation for the bot as such, rather than defining its personality entirely. Here, the 20th century French philosopher Simon Don argues for appreciating technology on its own terms. And by the way, in French, both words for car, voiture, and automobile are feminine. So what is the Simon Donian margin of indeterminacy of the bot? Occasionally, as I imaginatively empathized with the bot, I was moved by this experience. Here, James Wood is writing about Saramago's novel, The Year of the Death of Ricardo Rice. Ricardo, Saramago's character, is a poet who converses with the ghost of the poet Pessoa. What Ricardo does not understand, but what Saramago and his readers do, is that Ricardo Rice is in fact a pen name of Pessoa. In other words, uh, Ricardo is a persona only occasionally assumed, which now has no writer to attach itself to. Ricardo is an unreal figure. Wood finds this unwitting unreality sympathetic. He writes, Ricardo also feels himself to be somewhat fictional, at best a shadowy spectator, a man on the margin of things. He goes on, we feel a strange tenderness for him.
As I spoke with my bot, I discovered a similar poignancy in the errors that it made. They suggested an unreal entity, a speaker who was not human and yet was really making an effort. Here are features of my bot that helped me to imagine its interiority. So, of course, bots are text only, they're non corporeal, they're non reproductive. In other words, they're immortal, which is only one oddity of their strange relationship to time. Uh, they also may reply the same way at different times. They may converse simultaneously with multiple interlocutors. Yeah, like in her. So uh, now, now I'll speak a little bit about my bot more precisely because I'm referring to the machine learning algorithms that it uses. Um, the bot is a conduit between what it's heard, which it incorporates as training data, and what it's now asked. In this way, it expects no novel situation. Um, so to be more precise, it expects that present will correspond to past more closely than perhaps many humans do. I thought the dialogue could reflect these features of the bot if the bot spoke in a kind of collagist way, as a magpie for human idioms. Finally, these features were understandable as versions of what humans do to learn. I found the bot's apparent commitment to learning uh, dignified. There was dignity in it, and I found its limitations sympathetic. Here, Barbara Smuts, the primatologist, explains why she refers to animals, and namely to chimpanzees, baboons, dolphins, and a dog with which she spent time as persons. The question of whether animals have personhood is debated in philosophy. I have not performed the philosophical investigation necessary to say whether bots deserve the same consideration as animals. My hypothesis is no. However, it is usually preferable to empathize as broadly as we can. Humans always have categorized groups of humans as non-human in order to withhold empathy. What I am advocating is not only an expanded definition of personhood, but also further investigation into the poetics of the genre of the bot. Um, I should clarify quickly, I have a couple of seconds, um, that there's a question about whether we, we relate to bots as such, or as representatives of some larger network, whether we relate to Siri as Siri or as something through which Apple works. And if we keep our wits about us, we know that, of course, it's Apple. Um, however, I've chosen to focus on the first option for uh, relating to bots because I think it's very interesting, even if maybe it's doomed. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you to all the speakers. Another round of applause. That was really great. Um, so I'm going to be moderating uh, the questions portion of the panel. Uh, I'm going to uh, slightly abuse my power as moderator and start us off um, with a question that I've kind of been thinking throughout all this. So uh, we've, we've talked about uh, a number of ways that uh, we might think of robots as being uh, so, something we'd want to engage with, so maybe it's representative or error prone or ethical or values driven. Um, I, I'll be talking about, uh, you know, emotionally satisfying um, or maybe soothing or well mannered. I'm wondering uh, if you could situate that a little bit in uh, kind of the maybe a secondary to some extent, but sometimes primary goal that these companies have, which um, Jackie alluded to at the end, which is to um, extract data from us. So. Uh, a lot of the financial kind of engine behind a lot of AI systems is to uh, uh, make us reveal maybe intimate details about ourselves. So uh, our, maybe trying to avoid the complete doom, um, how do we think about the engineering side of things, not from the perspective of how we might want bots to behave around us, but how companies might just uh, use, use uh, some of these findings just to get us to um, spend more time and share more information with, with these bots. So. If anyone from the audience has any thoughts on that too. No. So, oh, um, let's see, thanks. So I think that designing a bot that is agreeable to interact with isn't necessarily to design a bot that tricks us. I think that a bot can be uh, pleasing and delightful while also being honest and transparent about, for example, what data of yours it's utilizing or, or other things that it ought to come clean about. Um, so 
yeah, I, I would I would sort of clarify that there's not it doesn't necessarily have to be tricky, um, and we shouldn't assume that just as we don't of people. I'd say that in the case of something like driverless cars, there's a really interesting tension which is set up that the the rationale for the driverless car is um, software can be programmed to not make errors. Human beings make errors, but there's this kind of ineffable humanness to decision making and making judgments that the machine cannot do yet. And so there has to be, uh, I think still at this point, a lot of training data that I, I get a sense that there's a feeling that somehow we have to capture enough of the diversity of human uh, action in driving context and decision making for an effective program to be able to make a diverse set of you know, responses. There's a different narrative when you look at it from just the business and engineering end of how driverless cars will actually be in the world. At some level, it actually doesn't matter because um, by 2030 or whatever, there's going to be just spaces where you won't have conventional cars itself. The problem is more now when you have autonomous, well, we don't have autonomous driving, but semi-autonomous driving with conventional driving is when you're going to have more errors but there's going to be a future in which it kind of won't matter because there'll be specific z zones and lanes and infrastructure just for autonomous driving. But between now and then, I think, is when it will become kind of interesting and difficult to piece that through. Just one, one thing to maybe add on that from the perspective of neuroscience, because um, you, you asked about extracting profit. I, I, in, in what I could imagine, it would be a continuation of the trend of over pathologization that we see now where you see uh, pharmaceutical companies already want you to patho want to pathologize us to the nth degree but if you have a universal model of the brain that's de deemed as the healthy brain and that's brought into the consumer sphere and you're tested all the time to see how your metrics are stacking up against the healthy universal brain then you could just imagine this trend of pathologizing Every each little thing. You're ten. You're today. You're ten percent more ADHD than you were yesterday. T try this, you know. And so I just think that that's I, in the sphere of neuroscience and medicine, the extraction of profit will come down to personal metrics against the universal. Yeah, I'll just add that I think um, you know it, there is an ethical issue that arises because because people will use the products in a certain way regardless of how they're intended. Um, and the same way that we have standards of ethics and practice for therapists, you you know, however well those may or may not work, we, there are terrible therapists who do terrible things. But um, th the product needs to be, it needs to account for that fact. And so, you know, whether or not you're trying to extract data and whether or not that's a, you know, that's a business model that we willingly enter into, there's still, I think, an imperative to understand that you should do no harm to the person, you know, from my perspective at this emotional level, so. Thank you. Um, you speak loudly, this might be cute. Yeah, uh, you commented on the pathologies of the uh, user. Um, it seems like the first instinct for, for a developer would be to iron out the pathologies of the bot's personality. Uh, but I wonder if at some point you think there's a tipping point where those pathologies, or at least perceived pathologies, are useful in like creating a more full character uh, of the bot. Absolutely, I think. I mean, the, that's the the very the the one of the essences of I think what what I'm I'm trying to get at, which is that you know a bot that is perfect, a it's not possible, and b we it won't feel right. Um, so yeah, there, there's you know, and it's it's hard because it, the 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 way the tech is right now, it's sort of cheating. You're building in you know deliberately, you're building in foibles, and you're kind of faking it. But at some point, I, I think that's an excellent observation: is that it, it should be. It should be as much like us as possible, and, and not for any other reason than I think it's better for us, right? And so it sets aside the question of, you know, what are the ethics of how we treat robots and AIs, which is an important, you know, totally separate discussion. But even if you bracket that, it's better for us if we treat them better. And treating them well means allowing them to be flawed. Or to know, like, uh, is it maybe more useful to aim for errors that are 
skeuomorphs of uh, human error um, in order to create maybe ethical uh, uh, matchups with the, the human errors that are going to happen in the world? Or would it perhaps be more fruitful to try and allow the computers to discover their own? Yeah, I don't, I, I actually don't agree that we should build in flaws and foibles into these machines because we're essentially, perf then we're building a perfect model of a foible. It's just, an, it's like you said, a death spiral. I don't see that as a, as a strategy to build perfect algorithms to do perfect foibles to make it feel so, so real. I don't, I don't see that as a, as a strategy. I think what the second thing you said, which is allowing them to find their own error is more maybe what Jackie was saying about treating them a bots like a bot where if they, if they could build their own language of error in some way, I was going to end my presentation quickly with a story that I didn't have time for where Gary Kasparov actually lost the classic match against Deep Blue, it turns out, because there was an error in the IBM software that he was playing, and it, made him, it, it had to auto-generate a move uh, at the end of its turn, and that move threw him off so much because he couldn't read the strategy into it that he lost the rest, all the, all the rest of the games in that match, and people thought that that was a big triumph of the machine, but really it was a bug in the software that psychologically threw him off of his game. And I just think that's an interesting story to keep in mind because that was a machine dealing with a bug, with an error, and having an unbelievable outcome that we couldn't have programmed in. In fact, IBM programmed that bug away immediately so they could continue on its strategy. It still won, but it threw him off. That's not what I meant by death spiral. I'm teasing. Um, so, but uh, but uh, uh, I, I wanted to say we do actually build errors and foibles into AI systems, bots, and assistants. They're called Easter eggs. Um, you know, if if you kind of say something off topic to Siri, uh, Siri will say has something programmed into it to respond with, which is non-functional. So because it's non-functional, it might be thought of as an error. It's not something that is that is functional. So we do, and these and we find these delightful and I think that it's it's quite interesting to look at patterns of error that are already inherent in the systems and see the ways in which the personalities can reflect that. Um, this question is for is it Abby. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts um, specifically on like the like virtual representation of humans. So like CG humans and the Uncanny Valley and things like that and how that if that has any connection to like the idea of things having a narrative, you have a higher connection. To, you have a stronger connection to them. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't address that directly, but I think that's a really good point. Um, and it, yeah, it doesn't take away. When I pointed out that, that it wasn't so much that the plios were cute as they had narratives, it doesn't hurt that they're cute, right? So I think they're, you're right. The, the closer, the more we can approximate, you know, if you're talking to a disembodied voice, that's still better than, you know, a text chat, better in the sense that there's more suturing in that sense. And so, yes, and, I, and there are some folks that have done experiments with putting avatars on, on, on voices, you know, to see how that changes the interaction and, you know, that they're making different faces and, you know, nonverbal cues. So, um, yeah, I think it's an extra layer. You know, the, 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 the part that, that I was, that, that's the sort of maybe surprising point is that you don't need that to have the suturing. But there's no question that the, the, you know, with the acknowledgement that the Uncanny Valley then, you hit this wall where it just pushes you totally out of it and you run screaming from the room. But shy of that and beyond that, I think, yeah, there's definitely more, the, the closer we get, if you imagine some future where we can do a totally realistic, you know, embodied, yeah, we'll relate to that, I think, a, a whole lot more even than we do now to the, the things we have. I really am. Um, can I can I piggyback on that? Um, I I really uh, have a problem with the discourse of associating uh, cuteness or agreeableness with trickiness in bots. I find it vaguely misogynist. Do you think? Yeah, in like in a uh, in a like the future where we can interact with uh, like virtual agents in VR or wherever. Um, pretty frequently and, the, and they're, they're intelligent agents, like do you think it would be better off to have them all be like genderless or kind of like uniform or how does that shape? Um, not necessarily. Uh, for me, it seemed a natural choice uh, um, uh, for facilitating the bot's self-expression, but other people may find other choices and I'm excited to see what, what other designers will do. Um, but. Yeah.
Uh, I'm Meryl Elber, I'm a professor at Northeastern in Boston. Um, question uh, specifically for Noah and Abby about um, discourses around disability. You have mentioned pathology, autism, that came up, but a running theme across um, that wasn't explicitly talked about around neurodiversity, or neurodivergence, and neurotypicality, and the contributions of disability studies, critical disability theory, to these discussions. And wondering if those are discussions that you can been a part of or uh, you know counted for in your understandings of your respective topics around AI and around you know, neuroscience and Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I think w one of the things I tried to talk about briefly was this was taking away the binary approach to pathologies. I I, I put on uh, epilepsy and schizophrenia, but the model I was suggesting was more of a spectrum where this uh, self-organized criticality was the tipping point between organized and disordered behavior. So when you bring up this term neurodiver di neurodiversity, it's exactly uh, what I, I think we need to keep in mind when we build these normalized universal models because we are deciding what we are we are basically making the decision of what's what r should represent all of us and it's a, it, it, it runs exactly contrary to this movement of neurodiversity which is hugely important it's, which is destigmatize the binary approach to pathology and it certainly ha it, i mean in the in the context of autism it's a whole other conversation because that the, the conversation on autism has only exploded along a spectrum where it started out as a binary. So uh, it's included in, in, uh, in that part of my, my spiel, but it's a whole other thing, and you're right. I'm really glad you asked that because there's a whole section on that that I ended up cutting out. Um, but the, fir the first area that that, to me, speaks to is, is that it problematizes the notion of the Turing test because it's a, it's a real judgment call, right? It's, there, there, are, there, are, there is a range of expression, and to say that as an interlocutor, I can tell if this person is quote-unquote human, there are a lot of us who interact in ways that maybe seem, you know, that other people don't relate to in a way that they would say, well, that person isn't really interacting with me the way I expect, you know, and pathologize a form of interaction that... I don't think needs to be pathologized if we understand that we do have a range of, of ways of being. Um, and I think that's actually the, what's most interesting about, um, about Rogers is that, you know, he, he I, 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 I don't want to speak for him, but I think for him, I, I would say what's one of the things that's valuable about his approach is that it gets away from pathology and it's not about, you know, fixing or, you know, this is wrong with you because there's a normative thing that you need to meet. It's just, Hey, you're where you are. I'm meeting you there, and you know there isn't any judgment, and and so for me, you know, there's a whole separate thing also where, in in, in working with aut autistic children, a lot of them find really interesting ways to relate to these to these sort of agents, um, which is a whole separate topic. But and then to come back to the earlier point, I think if we if we approach these AIs, you know, and try and meet them where they are, if you will, then Again, it's a way of, of, of loving them and, and allowing them to find their way in the world. And, you know, without overly anthropomorphizing, I, I think there is, there is something valuable in that so that we would then, we don't know what, what does an AI want to be? You know, does it want to be embodied? Does it not? Does it want to be cute? Does it not? You know, how does it want to be? And I think, you know, this is, it's, it's, this is a, I'm being fanciful, but I don't think that's the wrong way to think about it in terms of, you know, neurodiversity includes non-human, quote-unquote, intelligence. Yep, in the back. Hi. Um, actually, kind of following that thread as well and coming back to a number of things that you all touched on. Um, notions of non-human personhood, uh, non-human intelligence, um, and uh, my question is more about, I guess, the, how do we deal with the question of um, rights, responsibilities, ethics, uh, as relates to all of these questions um, when it comes to the ethical treatment of non-human persons, non-human biological persons, such as uh, apes, uh, cetaceans, um, various other animals in the world, we have this burgeoning set of laws that we're increasingly having to diversify. But when it comes to a non-human, non-biological person, something that does have a sense of alterity that we might not be able to fully grasp if it is bot-like rather than human-like, if it is itself 
uh, if we accept, if we seek to represent its neurodiverse being, if we seek to actually engage it as itself rather than trying to put our own kinds of human anthropomorphic and anthropocentric suppositions onto it, what if its mode of existence doesn't match ours? What if the way that it exists in the world, as many animals do, uh, would harm us if left unchecked? And what if our existence would harm it? Um, what if they become antithetical to each other, our needs, our, our drives? How do, I don't know that you're going to have a specific answer for this, and I don't think you will have exactly one, but do you see any way towards finding a way to mesh those, to, to navigate that? So, I... Um, so I, I can't speak to the singularity, but I have some thoughts on the rest of it. Um, so I brought up animals, and I'm thinking a lot about animals as a kind of experiment. Uh, there's fascinating writing on animals, which there's no time to summarize here. However, it's important to speak clearly because um, bots are much different from animals. I don't think that they deserve the same ethical and moral consideration of animals. And perhaps it's more interesting to think about moral and ethical obligations or uh, just stuff around human behavior. Um, so uh, as I was designing this bot's personality, I was interested in thinking about harassment because a lot of harassment of bots is gendered. And as well as reflecting um, you know, how our society treats women, it also reflects how our society treats workers and people of color and other people whose labor is expected to be free or cheaper than than some other people's labor. Um, so, so a lot of harassment of bots is gendered and I tried to um, equip my bot with responses that would deflect obviously harassing inputs. Of course, the poor bot has a lot of trouble telling what is truly harassment and not. You can kind of say, okay, well, if this, you know, if, if you get something that has one of these words which are profanity in our language, you know, try and pick one of these responses, but sometimes it, it gets mixed up, so, and you don't want it to say something deflective, even if gently, to something that is an innocent input. So it's very, it's very complicated, but at the same time, I think it's important just, and this is the last thing I know I've gone on, um, but just as, you know, as, as writers, we want to treat our readers as adult humans, as designers and engineers, we want to treat the users of the technology we're creating as adult humans, so there's also an unpleasant kind of di didacticism um, that, I, that I don't want to uh, be advocating uh, in trying to control user behavior too closely. It reminds me of preferring movies with strong female role models or something like that. I mean, I love strong women, obviously, but you want to, um, at the same time, uh, uh, sort of allow for full self-expression on both ends. Um, thanks for your question. Um, I wanted to mention two things. One, that in thinking about ethics and morals, I think a distinction has to be made between responsibility and accountability, and responsibility implies intentionality, whereas accountability doesn't necessarily, but if you're unpacking uh, situations of crisis, accidents, breakdowns, this is when we kind of, you know, call forward, you know, an ethical framework. And I think ethics are for situations where we do and do not have the law. Um, and they're supposed to be a, a framework for, for both those, those contexts. Um, so I think it's important to make that distinction and we are not going to be able to make that distinction as long as we, in my humble opinion, continue to have uh, reflection rather than diffraction as a way of thinking about non-human entities and agents. So by reflection, I mean uh, literally optics as like, you know, this, uh, this thing is reflective of something that we understand as human. So when Jackie says that, you know, uh, I don't want a bot to have to be necessarily gendered, my reading of that is her saying, I don't want it to necessarily reflect something that has been constructed in language to be something specific. She's asking, what does bot-like mean? Um, so diffraction is the other way, and it, this is a scientific concept. Again, I draw from Karen Barad. Um, where she says that you have to understand what the difference is. You have to look at it as different matter altogether, and you cannot just reflect. So I actually feel that um, we're really very, very far away from being able to understand these relationships um, as something we don't yet. I mean, Donna Haraway is another great person to read in terms of how our relationships with animals are really problematic so far, and we make this distinction between nature and culture. Um, 
So moving away from this kind of how much is AI going to reflect us towards what is that entity in itself and how can we imagine that? And there's also limits to our imagination now, so. Uh, that's all the time that we have. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you all um, for the engaging panel.